Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, is autism a blessing or a curse? And I'm in conversation with Pete Warmby. Uh, hi, I'm Pete Warmby. Um, I'm uh, a, an autistic teacher, um, parent and, and writer increasingly. Um, and obviously I'm most, most available on Twitter. That's probably where most people know me from. Um, cause you know, I, I do a lot of my autistic stuff on there. And we are talking today about whether autism is a, a blessing or a curse, but let's, let's start with the, with, with the Twitter. So that's where I've met you. That's my kind of happy, comfortable place as well. And you, you get in quite a, a lot of, um, people following and interacting with you on, mm. on Twitter now and hearing your kind of autistic message. So how, how did you s- sort of come to start using that as a medium? Um, it was accidental, to be honest with you. Um, I, I've been on Twitter for years and years and years, mm. since about 2009, I think. Um, but I, I only ever really moved around the education circles, you know, kind of getting involved in the debates there, mm. uh, which for anyone watching is always quite an exciting thing to do. Um, and, and that was the case for probably about 10 years. Um, then I got diagnosed um, in 2017 and I, I started dabbling a little bit. You know, I, I wrote a few bits and bobs. I, I remember I did a thread about Christmas at one point. I think that was in 2017 itself, but it did quite well. But then I, I, I just stopped and, and moved on to other things. Um, but then in, it was about a year ago, I just started writing these threads of um, basically, I just came up with this kind of concept of autism and X you know whatever it might be um and and i use these threads to kind of explore how autism had clearly affected me it, it was it, to be honest it was like self-reflective but with an audience um i'm not quite sure why i needed that but i kind of did just to kind of get the ideas out so i was doing things like um i remember one of the earliest ones was autism and holidays um, that was one of the first ones I did. So, you know, exploring how autism interacts with going on holiday abroad, you know, going on holiday with your parents when you're a teenager, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I did autism and I remember doing autism and Pokemon. That was, that was quite a good one. Um, <laughs> just to try to get, get to grips. It was you know, like my way of trying to work out how autism fit for me in my life. Um, and, and, and people like them. You know, pe- people were sharing them and, and commenting on them and followers started to go up. And I mean, I was on about 3,000, I think, this time last year. And I think now I'm over 20,000, um, you know, th- which is which is mad, really. Um, but but yeah, there's just something about them, I think, uh, pe- people enjoyed. I think I think I can be a bit brutally honest. Um, you know, I don't tend to leave anything out. And I think people quite like that. Um but in, in the process, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've figured out, certainly I've figured out autism for myself. I, you know, I kind of know how it works for me now. Um, how did you come to be diagnosed? And so you were diagnosed in 2017, so yeah. as a fully fledged adult. Well, yeah. Um, it was, well, it was all really about the birth of, of as I call the child, because um, yeah. I like to try and keep it as private as possible. I don't want people to know anything about them. Um, but yeah, the, af- after they were born, um, things like you know the sleepless sleepless nights and the worry and the stress and all those kind of extra bonus things that you get when you become a parent um they all started to add up quite a lot and things were very difficult and and i I think i came down with a you know basically depression at one point um but i didn't know why you know me being me i wanted to understand you know what the issue was and why it was that you know other parents didn't necessarily have the issues that i had sorry about that that's a car game by um the the worst thing i think was the the loss of personal time you know loss of kind of downtime um you know as soon as a child's in the mix you just don't really get anything like as much of that as you're used to having um and i noticed that and that made me wonder and it made me think and i was doing things like um cbt and i was i was working you know i was getting some treatment from the nhs you know the cam sort of stuff and it was okay it was you know semi-useful but uh, you know in the counseling and in the talking you know it just became more and more clear that there was something else going on underneath so i started researching you know possibilities like adhd and autism and things like that and um and yeah it just autism just seemed to fit so i i, I looked into it more 
Um, I spoke to people who knew me to see what they thought about it. And I went to the doctors and they, to be fair, were very, very good. You know, I got, I got a um, referral instantly, which I understand is not common no. at all. Um, you know, so I, I think between asking the GP and being diagnosed was probably about four or five months. Wow, that's quick. It is, yeah. I don't know whether there was just a, you know, hardly anyone in Wiltshire um, <laughs> getting diagnosed at that point. I, I have no idea why it was so fast, but it was it was very rapid. Um, so yeah, it was. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, was it important to you, kind of getting that label? It sounds like you were doing quite a lot of soul searching and trying to make sense of yourself. It was, yes, yeah. I think it's a common thing amongst a lot of autistic people that you, you because of how it affects you and how you. Um, how you have to sort of deal with the complexities of life with autism in a, in a way that can be upsetting for a lot of other people, you know, like let it, you know, you let people down because you can't face the social stuff. You, um, you have to go and hide away in a you know, quiet room for a bit and that upsets, you know, there's a lot of kind of social guilt, I think around autism, yeah. you know, um, and, and I think a lot of the time that can, that can um, sort of crystallize as, as autistic people feeling very, very strongly that they're bad people. Mm you know, there's something wrong with them in a very bad, nasty way, like they're rude or they're lazy or they're obnoxious or they're whatever negative adjective you want to use, really. Um, and I think that's quite pervasive. So for me, it was, it was, it freed me a little bit from those feelings of, of kind of guilt that I've had o over my life, of being a bit flaky and a bit unreliable and all the rest of it. Um, which was nice, you know, I mean, but it hasn't, didn't work entirely, you know, I still have those feelings. Um, but but it helped a little bit, um, and it also just helped me understand why, you know, why my life has gone the way it has. <laughs> you know, what do you uh, mean, like what? Well, I, I did a thread about this ages ago. The, 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 I don't think this is true of all autistic people. I mean, obviously, disclaimer: nothing's true of all autistic people. You know, I know that. Um, but but I think for for quite a few autistic people, that things like long term planning and kind of you know working towards an eventual goal. Is quite tricky you know I think that can be quite a, 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 a difficult thing to um, to manage when, when you're autistic um, and that's certainly been my case throughout my entire life I've just kind of floated through life like a balloon being blown wherever everything wants to put me mm -hmm. you know I can't say with any certainty at any point apart from possibly now where I am actually doing something that I want to do that um, that I'm actually going about and doing things that I genuinely wanted to pursue. You know, I just feel like I've been butted around and, and just like blown around by, by the whims of the world around me. You know, um, for example, I mean, I'm a teacher, but I never wanted to be a teacher. Um, you know, I think I'm relatively good at it, but it, you know, it wasn't my, it wasn't an aim. I just kind of ended up doing it as, as far as you can end up doing something like that. <laughs> That's um, quite a, a big thing to just sort of end up doing. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, it's, it's as close as I can describe it. Um, I remember at the time I was working in a in an office um, for this first aid company in Lincoln, and um, and I wasn't very happy. You know, the pay wasn't very good, and I noticed the teachers were being um, that year. Teachers were being paid quite a lot to train. I guess there was a shortage, mm. um, and I was just like, oh, okay, well, I could do that. You know, my dad's a teacher or was a teacher. Um, he's retired now, um, so I thought, yeah, I could do that. So I just signed up, and you know, it was it was there was no kind of no thought process really apart from just oh money okay that would do and off I went you know and, and just kind of see where everything would take me just you know kind of born by the current of the world um do you think te is teaching a, a, a job that is made easier or harder because you're autistic <laughs> harder it must be it must be I'm, I'm, I'm I mean like I say I've, I've done okay in, in in the job you know um I like to think I make a bit of a difference but you know the positives of autism so for example i don't know like you know my, my subject knowledge is good because i've kind of absorbed everything so much over the years and you know um you know been kind of hyper fixated on a lot of aspects you know because i'm an english teacher so hyper fixation on the books that i teach and that kind of and that that helps a great deal um but when it comes down to the you know the day-to-day -day, like the anxiety of, of every class coming in you know, never, never going away at all. You know, literally before every single class, you know, it's five a day, I have the same level of anxiety as I had back in the first year of teaching. Wow. You know, that feeling of, 
I don't want to do this. This is scary. And then they come in and it's okay, you know, and I get on with it, you know, and, um, and then they go and then it all happens again, you know, and, and for the longest time, I just kind of accepted. I just thought that's how it was. I thought that's what teachers did. You know, no, no one likes to be in front of a class. Um, <laughs> I just, I just rolled with that because, you know, in all things, I always just assumed that whatever issue I had, um, which was shared by everybody um now of course i know it's not really the case um so yeah that's that that you must be exhausted by the end of term i mean i know teachers are generally always but to feel that level of anxiety before every class every day must be wearing yeah well it is and then you've got the masking on top of that you know because when you're in, in front of a class i mean I, I have ways of doing it when you're in front of a class there's no way to decompress you know um if 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 you get stressed or if you feel like you know things are starting to kind of um cycle you know sensory issues or whatever like that you know when you've got 30 kids in there like looking at you you have to stay on top of it you know i mean i i developed my one kind of um mechanism for avoiding you know that getting too bad was was to you know get the kids working on something and then sit down at my desk mm -hmm. and look at something nice on the on on wikipedia <laughs> you know <laughs> something that interested me like i'd be on and you know the kids would see and they'd, they'd see you know what's mr warmby doing on google maps <laughs> you know, and they'd, they'd ask me they'd say so what, what are you doing <laughs> I'd just like, I'm just looking. you know i'm just i'm just tracing old train lines you know <laughs> across the country <laughs> because you know that that calmed me you know tremendously yeah. and it really helped um but then of course I, I, I mean obviously it's very likely that colleagues might might see this but uh that leads to guilt then to, or what if i get found out what if people find out that during lessons you know I, <laughs> i'm spending time on google earth looking at the old um you know the old remnants of industrial britain um I'd like to think they wouldn't be too cross about that, but still, you know. I suppose it depends um, on how the children are doing, isn't it? I mean, that's it. If the it children does. are focused and they're, <laughs> yeah. they're achieving, then... Uh... <laughs> yes, yeah, so but are they actually learning anything? Um, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I've, I've been, I've done pretty well, but but yeah, it's it's that kind of constant feeling of, you know, you're masking, you're pretending, you're acting. Um, yeah, I mean, by the end of the day, I'm exhausted. By the end of the term, I'm, I'm like, you know, the walking dead. Yeah, I, yeah. And has the period of, of kind of um, lockdown been good for you? Have you been teaching from home or how's that worked out for you? I did for a time, um, but then they expected <laughs> everyone back in June, whenever it was. Mm. Um, and I wasn't, you know, mentally robust enough, so I had to take a bit of time off. Um, but, you know, I, I did I did do my best. But, you know, it's, it's been difficult. It has been difficult lockdown. I, I, I like to be able to get around and about. Um, you know, I mean, I, I can entertain myself, you know, very well, very easily. And I'm quite happy being alone. But, you know, being being in the house with the family for the whole time, mm. you know, I mean, the poor old child, you know, no school, no summer school, no, no clubs, nothing like that. Just constantly having to deal with uh, the parents <laughs> around yeah. them all the time. I felt very sorry for them. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's it's been tough. It has been tough. You know, the the, the, the kind of lack of ability to just you know, again, get that downtime, bit of quiet time, you know, to, uh, to try to decompress a little bit. Yeah. And you're very open, obviously, about your autism on online. Is that something you're open about with your colleagues and your students as well? Are they aware mm. of your diagnosis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the colleagues, as much as I can, you know, I mean, um, they, they don't really ask too much, to be honest. Um, but, but students, I talk openly to them, you know, I'm absolutely you know no holds barred you know I share, I share a lot with them especially obviously students who are autistic um who i you know teach quite a few of really um there, there are a couple of year 11 students last year so these, these are kids who have obviously been affected by the grades um but but, but i think i had five or six autistic kids mm -hmm. in my year 11 class um and it, honestly you know so five or six out of maybe 15 or so it was a quite small set um, and honestly, sometimes we would just be, well, they were the bottom set, as they call them, you know, bless them. Um, but but we, 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 we fought that, you know, <laughs> we pushed as hard as we could. Um, but there were times where the six of us with autism in that room would just be chatting about it. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the class, you know, just not, not for a huge amount of time, but the rest of the class would just be listening, you know, just kind of uh, just trying to normalise it. You know, I'd be talking to them, you know, I'd say something like, oh, yeah, and isn't it horrible when such and such happens? Mm -hmm. um, and, and we'd have just this kind of little chat. 
and the rest of the class were, were great you know they, they they were really quite interested you know I, I don't see the point in um in hiding that kind of thing at all you know it's like you know autism so so common so prevalent it'd be a little bit like trying to hide that you were blonde or something you know <laughs> how, can, how can you do that you just got to, <laughs> you know it is what it is and how did your students you know have you found they've generally approached this, this idea about you know the the question for the episode was about whether autism is a, a blessing or a curse i mean what what would your students take on it be do you think what's your take on it i think my students it would depend entire as always it would depend on the individual i mean thinking about all the ones that i can i think you, you would probably get a 50 50 split you really would mm -hmm. I can I can see it. Um, I, can, I can see that happening. That, that there are a lot who are happy to kind of lean into it, you know, and 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 not in not necessarily enjoy it, but, but you know, as near as you can enjoy it, you know, yeah. make the most of it and 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 enjoy the kind of special or specials, you know, enjoy the the uh, the skills and the, the the traits that can have a really positive effect. Yeah. Um, but then there are others that hate it. You know, absolutely hate it. Um, often the boys, to be honest, which is oh, really? which is probably not what you'd expect, actually. No, that's a um, yeah. But for so, some of the boys, you know, who just want to fit in with the other lads, you know, especially the boys who are who aren't naturally, I don't know how to describe it, like aren't naturally kind of um, lonesome and geeky in themselves. I mean, back at school, I was lonesome and geeky, so I it, it worked perfectly for me. It was fine. But for those <laughs> autistic boys. Who um, who want to be in a, like a little gang and want to be a bit naughty and want to do the teenage boy experience, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think they resent it a little bit because it gets in the way and it makes things difficult. But you know, there's this stereotype that all autistic boys, especially, you know, are the stereotype of of you know geeky playing Pokemon and all the rest of it, and it's just not the case. You know, there are plenty of them who are, you know, that they're, they're cool, <laughs> you know, for want of a better <laughs> word, but they they they're not the same you know they're still not the same as the other kids and obviously as everyone knows in school if you're not the same then you're other and you're you're out there you know and that can lead to problems so you get quite a few autistic um children i think who 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 feel very angry about that you know they, they want to fit in they want to be like their mates and they know they're not and there's a bit of bitterness there i think do you think school is a particularly kind of challenging time if you're autistic? Because that whole thing of wanting to fit in is that's tough, isn't it? Because you can be an adult who is different and individual um, and yep. that's often yep. celebrated, isn't it? But as a child, that's that's harder, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to have a very strong personality, I think, as a kid to 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 kind of embrace being different. I mean, they, they, you know, plenty of children like that do exist. I mean, I teach mm. a fair few of them, you know, who are quite happy to be different and are quite happy to stand out. But you need a particular kind of mindset for that, I think, and it's not particularly common. Mm. Um, I, I think I think school is a nightmare for autistic people, um, teachers, <laughs> teachers and students. I think that you know the whole system is one of those that. I mean, let's face it, education hasn't really changed very much over the last. Mm. God knows how many centuries, you know, I mean, obviously more people do it now, but the actual kind of basic idea behind education, you know, you do it from the age of what, four to the age of 18. Um, you learn these particular subjects, you go to lessons, you know, you go lesson to lesson, different teachers, that whole kind of structure and system has been set up over, you know, centuries now, probably. Yeah. Um, just doesn't work for autistic people. It really doesn't, you know. I, th I think, you know, we've we've made the best of a best of a bad job, and we've tried to cope. Um, and you know, autistic people throughout the ages will have done their best, and they will have um, tried their hardest to 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 kind of um, move along with this kind of mechanism that school is. But it, it's it's not it's not really built for us at all. You know, it's a not, really not challenging me. environment and apart from the sort of social construct of it just the the kind of the physical environment as a sensory experience i go oh, yeah. to schools in my work and find myself thinking how did i manage this as a child and then of course i reflect well managing is a big word and i was you know an, a, an anxious depressed anorexic who self-harmed and was often suicidal so maybe i wasn't really managing that yeah, exactly. yeah, <laughs> came yeah. out with decent grades but yeah a bit of a mess but it's it's Wait, really it's a tough environment and and presumably you know for you as a teacher as well yeah i mean it's okay for me because you know <coughs> apart from when covid strikes i can just sit in my room 
Mm. Um, you know, and, and the classes come to me and that's fine. You know, that gives me a little bit of kind of ownership. I mean, you know, my classroom, as you can probably imagine, has got some Lego in it. Um, <laughs> uh not a distracting amount although at times um but but you know it's mine it's my space and i feel relatively safe there um but you know if, you, if you're an autistic child you know you you let's imagine that you you know you get settled into a lesson that you really like um and you know bonus of all bonuses they're looking at a topic that you're really interested in yeah. okay so let's let for sake of argument let's say we're doing english and you're really into victorian literature and that's what you're doing so for an hour you're like completely immersed and you love it and then the bell rings mm. and you've got to get up and you've got to say bye to all of that and go and do PE. Yeah. You know, you've got no choice. You've got to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to be in considerable trouble. Uh, not that that puts a lot of autistic children off. I mean, you know, when you think about how, um, how frequently autistic kids are excluded and things like that for, for, you know, bad behavior as they call it, when often it's just a, a case of self-defense, you know, and self-preservation. But, you know, this poor hypothetical kid, you know, who, who loves English, you know, forced to, you know, drop it at a moment's notice and go and do a completely other, totally different subject, one that they don't, maybe not, don't like, one that's completely different skill set, one that they're probably not very good at, one they're not interested in. And then after another hour, it's another change, you know, and bang, you're doing something else again. And it's, it's not something I could, I, I would want to do again. No. You know, if, 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 if and, and I did have the chance of doing this actually a while back. We were encouraged to kind of shadow a, a child. Uh, sounds kind of sinister, but it, <laughs> it wasn't. Um, you know, we just kind of had to go around the school, like, and see it from their eyes, you know, kind of experience yeah. the school day from the eyes of the child to remind us, because obviously for some of us, it's been a very long time. Um, and I hated it. Absolutely mm -hmm. hated it. You know. The only time I've done that as an adult was um, when I was a governor at a special school. And of course, special schools operate quite differently. Um, mm. And it, it was it was OK, still challenging. But yeah, I think very different than that idea of, you know, every hour you're moving on to something different. I think, yeah. Yes. So you yeah. declined the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it for a bit. But yeah, it was it was an unpleasant experience. You know, I'd yeah. never do it again. Um, <clears throat> So tell me about Lego then. So yeah, just just going for all the autistic stereotypes here. You like Lego? <laughs> I do, and and to my to my credit, I like Lego trains too. So oh, well done. You know, that, oh, that, you good autistic, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, Lego. What can, what can I say? It's. I'm currently. I'm. I'm. I'm writing a book about this. Actually, at the moment. I mean, it's. It's only just been finalised, but it's about special interests, hyperfixations, and I'm going to have a whole chapter, obviously, on on Lego. So it's. It's difficult to get my thoughts in order about you know what it is about the stuff. Um, it's the. It's. It's the, almost like something to do with the tactility, like the way it feels. And the way it looks. Yeah, I can remember when I was being diagnosed. I mean, this must have been the moment where the person diagnosed me went, right, yep, stamp, autistic. <laughs> um, because, <laughs> because they said, you know, why do you like Lego? And, and I went into a kind of flight of fancy about, you know, I don't know how familiar you are, but when, when you buy a new set of Lego, and it's all in the little bags. Yes, yes, yes. And um, exactly, that's the. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I love Lego too. As an adult, I haven't gone there, but you're making me get. I should. My children need to learn Lego. I need Lego in my life. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you, you know, you get those bags, and, and you feel, you know, that they're heavy because it's good quality stuff. You know, it's good. It's yeah. well made. You know, there's something nice about well made things. Um, but you know, the, the colours and there's all the little translucent pieces. And honestly, it's like gems. They're like little little jewels. Mm -hmm. You know, just all all, all different colours, all different shapes, all very shiny and new and exciting. And not only that, but you know, when you take them all out of the bag, these little jewels end up creating something bigger and better. It's it's it's, it's incredible, really. And do um, you always follow the instructions, or do you freestyle? I, I do both. Um, you know, if I buy a set, you know, like these ones here, um, I'll follow the instructions. Um, but then with any spare bits that I've got, or if I decide I don't like a set anymore and I just kind of dismantle it and use it for other things, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do my own thing. Um, and I design, I, I, I design sets online as well. Um, there's kind of programs on, on, on the internet where you can, um, create kind of electronic versions of sets. Um, which is quite wow. nice, you know, basically design your own sets. Um, there, there was one that I put on Twitter quite a lot recently, the, uh, this um, Tudor hotel thing that I'd made, you know, and, and you can try and get Lego to actually make them. You know, if you get enough kind of wow. votes, then they actually go ahead and, um, uh, uh, and release them as a set. 
so you know that's, that's the so end. cool see mm. i always struggled with the freestyle lego thing like i i love following the instructions but mm -hmm. um i i found it hard if just presented with it to know yeah what what to do where to go with that yeah where do you start i, I need to have a very clear idea in my mind before i start otherwise i just kind of sit there staring at it thinking i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to be thinking right i want to build a you know, I don't know, the station or something. And then, 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 I'm, then I'm away. But if I haven't got that kind of fundamental idea, then I'm just lost. And it's a brilliant thing as well, isn't it? I, I've done quite a lot of work with um, uh, teaching, learning support stuff and people like that about using the kind of basics of kind of Lego therapy and Lego as a, as a you know, sort of therapeutic tool, both in terms of the tactile and the building, but also the stories you can tell with it. And I mean, there's lots and lots of different ways that you can, you can kind of go there with it, isn't it? But even just in its most basic form, it, as you say, it feels nice, doesn't it? And, and It does, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of tactile. Uh, that tactile and it hasn't changed i think lots of things feel like they've changed over time but lego feels exactly the same now as it did you know when we were five six seven years old it's it does it does i mean you know there's new elements you know new bricks and things but they all have the same like you say the same texture the same feel to them the same weight you know they haven't um you know deteriorated in quality or anything like that like some things do yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, of course, it lasts forever. You know, I mean, I've, I've got Lego from when I was a kid yeah. um, that's still perfectly usable. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you about a tweet you you uh, you tweeted yesterday um, and, oh. and what was kind of behind this. So you said, um, put your hand up if getting diagnosed with autism made you, for whatever reason, more autistic. Um, and I just wondered, what, what did you mean by that? And where were you going with that? And was that your experience? Yeah, I think what I was getting at was the fact that, you know, you find out that you are autistic. And I think a, a very common um, kind of outcome of that is you realise how much you've been pretending um, all your life. And you sort of start to just feel a bit more maybe comfortable in in, in the role, if you like. You know, you, you, you kind of just settle into it a little bit. And, um, and I think in doing that, the mask slips um and you are more more likely for example i don't know like little things like to, to say no to things you know you don't want to do or to uh or to, or to be quite open about why it is you need to leave the room and just little things like that you know so everything becomes a little bit more obvious i guess um because you're diagnosed because you're comfortable or well, you know increasingly comfortable with who you actually are um and you feel validated too so you feel like you can now say no because it's like well you know a, a professional person's told me yeah. that you know I, I don't have to do this kind of thing anymore <laughs> um, and and I think but but you know that that was only half of it of course you know the, the other half of the tweet was you know the impact of that then on your relationships um because you know I, I guess I was getting at the fact that you know that that, that level of sort of leaning into your diagnosis is probably relatively inevitable but then what that does to your relationships with especially neurotypical people around oh, you said yeah does it does it irritate people yeah, yeah yeah and i think because i think it does yeah. and certainly from the from the replies that i got it seemed to be quite a common thing um you know that, that people were like well, actually yes yeah you know I, I did suddenly start acting more autistic and that really wound people up <laughs> you know they, 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 they didn't like it you know because for whatever reason and you could spend probably hours looking into this years even neurotypical people aren't very happy or comfortable around openly autistic people um i've got to be careful you know i don't want to demonize or vilify or anything like that because it's not fair but but it does feel that way sometimes yeah you know so i've generally found that as long as i'm open and honest that people are um are really helpful and will mm -hmm. support me but then i guess i'm mainly thinking about going into lots of new situations all the time and when i say you know i'm speaking at your event thanks so much for having me i need a room i can quietly go to at lunchtime and please don't make me eat with everyone kind of thing <laughs> uh, because i'm autistic and then people bend over backwards to help but i think they do. They yeah do. that's probably a different experience when you're going as a visiting keynote speaker than you know in in, in kind of day-to-day -day life i i found one of the things that i found more challenging is just uh, a bit of a disbelief i guess and when yeah. people go, oh but you can't be autistic because of x because of y because of z and you kind of find yourself wanting to defend yourself and going but you've got no idea how hard i had to work to to look normal in I that know. situation I <laughs> but, but i have given up now i don't even i just let it roll it's it's not yeah, you can't my engage. no yeah. no i mean because you, you end up you know when that happens and you start defending yourself and you start kind of going into 
but 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 you know yeah. i'm exhausted it's only eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah. i'm actually nice to have a shower um because you just sound like you're moaning you know you sound yeah. like you're whinging you're whining you're being negative and they switch off and they don't care yeah, yeah it's, it's a bit it can be a, it can be a bit of a downer to be honest you know um i mean i i do like to think that if a non-autistic person could just somehow you know get a window inside the, the mind of an autistic person just for a moment yeah. and experience what life is like that they'd be blown away by it mm. you know in what um, sense? The, the sensory things you know the i mean it's obviously again different for everybody but but you know just general commonalities like the sensory issues the kind of everything being very intense and extreme the uh, the feeling of anxiety that's been created by you know a lifetime of failed communications um you know fear of social situations i think it would be overwhelming i mean yeah. I, I guess entering anyone's head for any amount of time would always be overwhelming but i think it would be particularly difficult to handle you know and, and i think it, it would i think that's why you know some of these um you know organizations like nas that try to do these videos and, and things like that that try to sort of illustrate what autism's yeah. like is it's a very valuable thing i mean i haven't seen many that really nail it yet but but, but you know some some are quite good yeah you know and i think they're really quite valuable did you ever see the show of the oh no the curious incident of the dog in the night time i read the book i haven't so, seen the um so the show the book i loved and the show i especially loved i took my um husband we went actually when i was in hospital um and we went for a trip out which was a really big thing um but the thing that was so amazing about it was um i mean the whole thing was great but in particular there's one scene where he's at a train station and i re i can't yeah. go near trains at all um i find them completely overwhelming for a whole variety of things but one of the things i find particularly difficult is how over overwhelming big busy train stations are and just the way it was depicted in this show I was suddenly able to just say to my husband that's what it's like that's exactly what it's like for me and it was I don't remember it's something they'd done the kind of light and sound and it was yes. quite yeah. overbearing and as an audience member but it, it yeah it, it explained it in a way I never could um, yes yeah, yeah. I, th I think that kind of thing is fantastic you know and, and th I think the more autistic people that you get you know, working on things like that and having input and things like that, you know, just to really nail it down, you know, yeah. precisely. Yeah, that's exactly how it is. I remember the um, the video that the NAS did about the, the, the child in the shopping centre. Um, I don't know whether you've seen that one. No. Um, they're just kind of walking through a normal shopping centre, but we're seeing it from their point of view. Um, and, it, you know, the camera keeps cutting to all the different things that are making a noise or that are kind of, you know, kind of busily occurring um you know there's like a, a perfume stand and they're spraying perfume and you know there's this idea obviously very strong smell there's the um photo booth with a flash going there's the music there's the guys you know it's a couple of people shouting and talking and it's all too much for the poor kid who ends up having a meltdown mm -hmm. in the middle of the store um and it's it's quite moving it's quite emotional really because it's you know that is exactly how it is um but we just need more of that you know we, yeah. we need we need more more autistic television, more autistic film, you know, um, just to try to, I think one of the most important things is just to try to, you know, it's like, you like seeing yourself re represented on TV, don't you? Mm. Everyone likes that. And, you know, and as a white male, you know, white cis male, then obviously I'm, I'm, I'm in Candyland because, you know, it, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm represented everywhere. Um, but there's, you know, but, but autism isn't, you know, there's that, mm. that, there's that one little kind of um, gap there. That, that I feel would be so beneficial for the autistic community if there was more representation out there, um, just to make us feel more validated and more like we are actually really a part of the earth and its people, <laughs> rather yeah, than a strength that's, yeah, so Not small in number. What do you, do you feel about like, see i i've had a, one of the one of the challenges i have with diagnosis hey i i felt quite stupid to finally be diagnosed um without having any clue that i might be autistic having worked with autistic people and and knowing about it as a condition for many many years it hadn't occurred to me that might be my my story but um also having you know things like having worked with a special school um which um supported children who um were you know 
very much more challenged by their autism than I am. I find it hard sometimes to own that label, you know, when actually you're able to, to hold down a job and do normal things and have a family yeah. and yeah. talk. Um, it, it can be difficult. Yeah. It feels wrong almost that there's that, you know, we just have one big bucket and, and we all sit in it. And, and, and there are days, you know, I have days when I, I I've had days when I, I can't talk, I can't move, I can't do anything, but they're very, very, very few and far between. And how do you, do you feel about that? Is it okay to kind of own that label fully? And, and do we need more representation from kind of non-verbal autistic people or? I think we definitely do. Um, the, the, the thing is, there's quite a lot of non, non-verbal autistic people out there who are, you know, trying very hard to, to you know, make, 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 themselves, um, make themselves known, you know, mm. blogs and things like that. Um, but you know because the, the, their number is obviously slightly lower than, than you know the, the rest of the autistic community it's very difficult for them to be noticed you know above mm. the kind of above i mean i try when, when i can you know to, to kind of uh, raise them but i don't do it enough don't know anything mm. like as much as i ought to um there, there are twi- twi- you know, twitter accounts out there who do their very best yeah. um there's, there's a south african um lady um uh, tanya i think her name is mm-hmm. who does a lot of good good work on that you know kind of trying to elevate these voices um but you know so so yeah there, there needs to be a more kind of varied representation of autism too but you know there is only one representation of autism in the media anyway at the moment really and that's kind of the sheldon character mm-hmm. you know the sort of comic relief um awkward cold uh you know geeky almost to a fault you know that kind of very mm-hmm. very lazy stereotype is pretty much you know i mean obviously i'm aware there are other um autistic characters out there but you know in the general population i think that 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 is pretty much the the idea of what autism is in the media um you know maybe with a sprinkling of rain man on the side or something for (laughs) older people um you know when what we really need is 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 people to be I mean, I, I only watched, I've only seen a little bit of She-Ra, for example. You heard She-Ra? No. Um, through, my, my, through the child. Um, mm-hmm. It's a cartoon, you know, it's like a, 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 a it's mostly um, female characters kind of battling um, some evil threat. But there's one character in that who's very definitely coded autistic um, and was coded autistic purposefully. And I think there are autistic writers on the team that put effort into this. I think her name's Entraptor. Um, and she's into technology and that kind of thing, but she's a very, very different sort of autistic character. Okay. You know, she's very enthusiastic, very excitable, really passionate about things, you know, like very different to Sheldon, very different mm. to um, who else is there, you know, the kind of typical characters. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's fantastic. Mm. And we, we need a lot more of that, you know, because otherwise there is just this kind of one avenue of, of, of you know, um, one trope if you like of autism yeah. in the media yeah. and it's it's just no good well when it comes to owning the label i mean obviously all you need to do is spend a day on twitter to know that there's a lot of argument about about this kind of thing you yeah. know um you know high functioning labels those kind of things you know and and um i'm I, i've always been on the side of of if you're autistic it doesn't matter how your autism you know um manifests you are autistic and that will have mm. challenges and even though those challenges might be hidden and might be you know kind of easily easily um masked over it's still there and it's still very very difficult um mm. i i think but you're right it is difficult because you know it's, it's such a wide range of experiences all kind of um plonked under this one label mm. um that you know it can get a bit unwieldy but you know, when you think about, you know, I mean, humanity is quite vague and enormous and different in all of its different <laughs> That's structures. True. We, we still talk about human rights, don't we? You know, there's yeah. like a, a fundamental set of things that should always be the case. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's important for autistic people, even if they feel like their phone is, you know, like they're, they're um, intruding on the world because, you know, yeah, they've got a job or they've, they, they can speak in public or whatever. I think it's important to still own it because there will be things. I mean, I'm going to finish off this for example and I've you know I've been talking away and all the rest of it but after this is done I'm going to be done for the day you know mm-hmm. this, this is going to wipe me out um and I think you know unless we own that and we you know and we, and we share that experience um autistic people are still going to be you know have 
prejudice against us you know mm. i think we need to we need to be very open about about the, the challenges and the difficulties i think that's important actually isn't it that's something i've tried to be a bit more honest about in my own experience not just with autism but just more generally we've got a whole range of different challenges or quite how intertwined they are i don't know but i think quite often people only see the public facing bit don't they and if that if what they see is you standing up on stage and you know looking good and well put together and that's the day you've washed your hair and you're presenting well then that's great but if they don't see the bit where then you know for me I'll have to go off and climb or literally spend time just on my own or mm -hmm. just not manage for a day or two like you it's yeah. you know yeah. it's a bit of a roller coaster and people only see the bits that you you allow them to see so it's about how how brave we should be in sharing those bits although so autism comes in many very different guises do you think there are any kind of universally helpful things that the world and other people can do to to help to support if i could wave the magic wand um i think the one thing that i would ask uh, you know for, for people for non-autistic people to have for autistic people is just automatic belief you know automatic oh okay well you just told me that you're autistic I'm going to believe that. I'm not going to question it either openly or in my own mind. I'm just going to go, oh, okay, and then work with that information because it is terrifying how little that happens. Yeah. You know, it really is. And I think that that is behind some of the most difficult stuff that we have to deal with. You know, um, if, if you say that you've got a broken leg, Mm. And that's not a great analogy. I understand that, you know, because obviously broken legs are a thing that happened to you and, you know, they get better. But just as a for sake of argument, just because obviously it has, it has effects that makes your life more difficult. If you tell someone you've got a broken leg, um, then, then there's kind of instant, you know, everyone just moves mountains to help you, don't they? You know, and yeah, it's just yeah. a completely different thing. You say to somebody, for example, that you're depressed just to bring mental health into it. And that's a whole new world then of, ooh, mm. you. <laughs> okay, you don't know how to deal with that. Well, on earth, you know, why have you shared that information? <laughs> you know, yeah. We didn't need to know that. Like it's a taboo, it's a dirty thing almost. Um, you say you're autistic. And yeah, like you said, the first thing you're most likely to get, especially if you've just been on stage, or especially if you're a teacher or you're, I don't know, you, you, you're adept at masking, the first thing you'll get is, no, you're not. Yeah. don't be daft <laughs> and almost like that's a compliment isn't it like, yes 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 yeah. like, don't be so hard on yourself yeah. you know don't put yourself down like that <laughs> it's like, I'm not putting myself down i'm telling you that I'm, i am this thing it's like you know yeah. saying oh i've got a beard or oh, don't put yourself down like that <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't be so rough on yourself it's not you know you, you can barely see it you can barely see it <laughs> <laughs> that's not the point um it's it's really really strange that that is the first but i think it is it's a kind of a really it's like a misfiring of the human desire to make people feel better about themselves yeah it's like it's coming from a good place you know we, we all when you know if somebody says oh i feel really down you know um blah 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 then you say oh don't worry it's fine you know that's, that's our automatic reaction we try to make people feel better and happier it just misfires with autism more than yeah. pretty much anything else i think um adhd possibly um but you know with autism you, it just seems to trigger this response of oh no no don't be so you know don't don't feel so bad you know like it is a really negative thing like you know yeah. and it isn't you know it really yeah. isn't i mean if it wasn't for autism you know i i wouldn't i wouldn't have any of the hobbies or the interests that i have you know i wouldn't have the brain i've got i wouldn't have the 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 skills i've got you know it's it's completely you know intertwined with everything that, that makes me me and it might be a bit rough sometimes but it's you know it's not something to con you know you don't want condolences for it no you know no, absolutely not. what do you think is the best thing about autism for me personally the best thing is is just the way my brain works um which i i oops just sat like it um, <laughs> <laughs> like, um which I, I think i can ascribe a lot of it to autism i mean some of it's probably not some of it might just be you know how my brain works you know w without autism but um you know things like i don't know i it's very hard to describe how things work in your own head but it, like like visual imagination for me is very 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 strong you know really quite potent and that's not the same for all autistic people i mean you know uh, aphantasia and things like that can, can can be like the exact opposite but for me autism seems to have kind of manifested in 
just this ability to you know hold in my head entire like places that aren't even real you know um and i've spoken to a few other autistic people have got this you know and we we almost use them as a kind of escape hatch to to run away into you know to i'm a bit um, jealous of that (laughs) i I know i i would be (laughs) you know it's it's that i think you know that that is behind some of my love of certain things like lego for example making my own little world um minecraft you know the, the video game was is a huge thing for that i mean i've spent eight years now on the same world on minecraft just just making a a country basically wow. you know um with mountain ranges and cities and towns and oceans and you know all the rest of it you know and it's it's just all when I mean, it's all here you know i can walk around it in my own head i don't actually need the game to, to enter it I, you know i remember it, i know exactly how it looks and it's all in here um and yeah i ascribe that to autism i think you know that that because it's it's such a strong kind of um almost powerful ability you know it's, it's uh, certainly a bit different i think so yeah. i mean i can't know for sure but i, I certainly say that I, I pin i pegged that one up with autism i think well no, yeah no no absolutely and, and as you say it sounds like it's a it's a common experience with some other autistic people and i think that ability to to kind of hyper focus and maintain interest over a long period of time as well is, uh, yeah. is 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 certainly something that um that many of us share um I, I always ask people to to kind of share a, a closing thought and unless you had a, a specific idea I wondered if you might share some words of reassurance or advice or guidance for anyone who might be newer to a diagnosis either for themselves or perhaps for a child and um, what thoughts you would share with them um I guess you know if you're new to a diagnosis for yourself or someone near you I think the most useful thing you can probably do is 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 listen listen to other autistic people um not because they've got all the answers or because they're somehow you know guardians of the knowledge or anything like that but just because you know there's a lot of us who are really willing to talk um and it might just be that some of the things that we say or write or communicate in whatever way um are useful you know and, and i think you know there's this amazing resource online on twitter and elsewhere on facebook as well although i don't really i don't go there because it's facebook um where you know there are people sharing their experiences and, and it's it's like a gold mine of information and insight and um and i think i, I think you know you, you wouldn't want to waste that I, th- I think make the most of that you might not necessarily agree with it all um it might not all apply you know it might be different experiences of autism but but it's all there and it's all open to to be read and to be listened to and you know and i, and I think i think that that could have a huge impact mm-hmm.